You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. There's a cat over here. There's a cat over there. And the wrong one died. And the wrong one died. Welcome to The Wrong Cat Died, the podcast breakdown of the cat catastrophe. I'm your host, Mike Abrams, and today we have another amazing guest. She is an incredible th- theater content creator and has performed in all kinds of shows over the years. I'm sure you've seen her work on social media, and she told me she has some very fun hot takes on cats. So welcome, Olivia K. De Silva, and thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. I, you know, before we just briefly chatted, but I always love when people reach out to me because a lot of times it's like, oh, I've got this hot take of cats because it was my first show or for years. But you just told me that you just recently were immersed in the Jellicle world. So let's start there. Tell me about your first time seeing the show and when was it? How did you experience it? What did you think? Okay, so this kind of, I mean, this kind of starts like a long time ago. Uh, My brother and I had a VHS that had a like trailer for a recording of cats before it and so for years like that was my just like that was the only knowledge i had of cats was this trailer of these people just as cats dancing so around not the 1998 movie you had a, a trailer for the 1998 movie yes <laughs> you had like two minutes or Literally. 30 seconds and i didn't even know like i all i knew is that it was called cats and there were people just like cats and i just I know it was a VHS of my brother and I like watched way too often because yeah. it's so ingrained in my memory. But that was all I knew of it for the longest time. And then last February, it came to Chicago for a week and I was invited to opening and I went in completely blind. I brought my brother too because I was like, hey, you remember that trailer? Yeah, It's coming. We got to go see it. Um. So, yeah, we both went in completely blind to the show. I had no idea what it was about. I had never listened to the soundtrack, nothing. And I was so fascinated by what was going on on the stage that I had to see it again. So yeah. I went back for closing <laughs> five days later. Um, and honestly, it's it's just, it's the most, I can't even explain it. It's the most intriguing show I've ever seen in my life. I still think about it. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's it's amazing to me because I think you and I had very, it seems like we have very similar scenarios, which is you went with very minimal knowledge. I had even less. I didn't have the VHS trailer. I had zero. I knew memory and that was it. And it had come to Broadway in 2016 and same thing. I was invited. I went and I thought about it for like weeks after. Um, and you did. I didn't have, I didn't go back. You went back five <laughs> days later, but yes. I was just like, what happened was kind of my like my mind going through. So walk me through like what were the biggest from that first viewing questions that you had about the show or thoughts that you had about the show? Like what was it a you couldn't sleep at night because you're thinking about it type of things from that first viewing? Oh, uh, gosh. Well, first of all, I kept asking everyone what in the world a uh, Jellicle cat was because yeah. yeah. I just was like, Huh? That I think that was my biggest question. I was so confused by that. I was also very confused by the whole concept of the heavy side layer. I was like, are they are they dying? Is that their heaven? Like I don't understand what's happening here. Yeah. Um yeah, a lot of questions, which is why I went back. And the second time I saw it, I was a lot more like I found certain things that I really, really loved. I'm fascinated by Rum Tum Tugger. Mm-hmm. Easily my favorite character. Um, I really like classic rock and stuff like that. And he was just the most rock and roll character of this whole show. So I was instantly just drawn to him. Um, yeah, you had a very, I think you saw Hank too. So you had Hank. Yes. Santa, so you had incredible Tugger. Mm-hmm. Very rock and roll. Loved, loved him as Tugger. Um, and then obviously memory. I mean, we all know memory. Mm-hmm. So that was another pull because hearing it and seeing it so very different <laughs> yeah <laughs> completely different experiences um yeah, the emotion of it is yes. crazy mm-hmm. and taylor who was mm-hmm. Isabella, was just absolutely phenomenal 
Um, what an incredible talent. Mm-hmm. I got to see her do it in DC and uh, unbelievable singing memory. Almost, almost made me question my podcast because I was like, <laughs> ah, this is good. There's been a couple of Grizzabellas where I'm like, Man, this is this is good. This is a good memory, but I still don't have my vote. No, truly, she was phenomenal. Um, so did you did you go to like the Wikipedia page and start looking stuff up? Like what? Like I have a T shirt that says "WTF is a jellical cat," and so like I because I had a lot of similar questions. I also had a question of who named these cats, and and I realize it comes from the poems, but <laughs> like who came up with these? No, I had the exact same thought. Because the names are just so, like, I don't know. It takes a very special mind to come up with stuff like Rumble Teaser yeah. and Mungo Jerry. <laughs> Jenny and Edad. Yeah. They're all, they're all crazy. So, and and then did, what's your opinion on the heavy side layer? I, I'm going to be honest. I'm still kind of like, it's just the great beyond that we don't know about. <laughs> you don't think it's, so... I, I do like there's a lot of theories and there's a lot of like I'm sh- not sure there's a correct answer. Some people think it's right before heaven. It's like the area right before heaven. Mm. Some people think it's just a space in the Winter Garden Theater in the attic. Um, some people think it's the process of being reborn into the next life. So cats have nine. This is the heavy side layer is just your transition period to the next one. But it's kind of strange. There's like not a clear answer and. Over the years, it's like, do you go up to the moon? Do you like walk off stage? Does the thing break and you have to kind of figure it out? Do you fly? Like, there's not like a consistent way that they go up. Now that I think about it, I think my first conclusion of the heavy side layer was these cats being like transitioned off to be like adopted. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's like they're home. going to the farm up north. Yes. Like here, you can go out into like public now. So someone will find you and you'll find a home kind of thing. <laughs> I like that. That's, I haven't heard that one. What's going to, we're going to, this is your choice that you're going to now get adopted. You're not going to be in the junkyard. Yes. You're going to get a nice, comfy indoor cat life now here. <laughs> That's, I've not heard that, but I, I like that theory. That was definitely my first like conclusion. I was like, that's gotta be it, right? They're not mm-hmm. dying. Tell me they're not dying. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, that was my joke was that they're yeah. that one cat's murdering cats, just like annually sacrificing one here every year, which is uh, to me was its, its own bizarre part of this is we're just going to be comfortable with that being the core plot line is that it's going to be a cult like murder. I think I like I personally like that conclusion better because I think that's hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More than that, the the being adopted so wholesome. It's like I here's know. a very, very warm and fuzzy modern. We're gonna take this and just send them to a nice, you know, suburban <laughs> home. We're gonna take them out of the junkyard in London or in, in Broadway in New York at Times Square. <laughs> They're gonna go to Long Island or you know somewhere and have a have a nice indoor multiple story home to. To spend your time and and eat Buster for Jones like meals. Yes, um, for you. that's at least what I'm going to tell myself. <laughs> that's the yeah. I'm I'm a uh, I'm comfortable with that version of the heavy set layer. I think that's a that's a much more positive spin on this show than than the rest. So let's let's stay on that track then. Seeing it as an adult, it's different than seeing it as like a five or six year old kid. Did you notice how sexual and like the undertone of all of that? Like, did you pick up some of those other plot lines that are very clearly there that almost are hard to see in the first viewing, but maybe you caught in the second viewing? Oh yeah, <laughs> definitely yeah. in the second. Most of the most of the things that I picked up on were from the second time I saw. Yeah, it. because truly the first time I saw it, the whole time I was just like, wait, what? Wait, yeah, wait, what's happening? <laughs> wait, <laughs> who are these people? Uh, yeah, no, the second time I saw it, I definitely picked up on that. Mostly when it came to like, um, Tucker and like anyone around him, because that's just so blaringly obvious. <laughs> mm-hmm. Did you pick up the Demeter, Bombay Arena, McCavity kind of piece with that song? I didn't. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the, I, I, I mean, when I did research later on, I was like, <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, when you when you read that that was so that was my reaction too, which is kind of fun. Not fun because it's such a dark storyline. <laughs> but fun in the sense that as I watched that song, I'm like, that is a fun song. That McCavity song is mm. awesome. I loved it. 
it's also one of the few moments where there's not an overwhelming amount of cats on stage. It's mm-hmm. that and Mungo Jerry and Rumpel Teaser. So you kind of get to pick up a little bit more of like, oh, here's what's happening versus having 25 cats in your face dancing. But when I read about it, I'm like, oh, she was sexually abused by McCavity. That's like a known truth. That's like the one thing that everyone says. I'm like, who wrote this this (laughs) story? Like, who came up with this? Because that's the part where my first viewing, I didn't notice. My second viewing, I also didn't really notice, but I kind of caught a little bit more of the like tension. You can see the skittish Mm. nature of Demeter. But then I started reading about it and it's like, oh yeah, of course. And so I'm always fascinated by someone like you who's only seen it twice in a five-day period of how much of those things did you pick up or how much of those things are still totally, completely, like I had to research this after. Oh yeah, I know. I keep telling everyone that I need it to come back to Chicago so I can see it like five more times because I know that there's so much in there that I still haven't discovered. Mm -hmm. You got to check out the 1998 movie. I do, I do. Get that VHS back up and... (laughs) You have the trailer. You have the teaser I for do. it. <laughs> You've got somewhere somewhere buried in in your uh, place. You can find a VHS player. I gotta find it. It's just like a full circle moment from my childhood that just needs to happen. <laughs> Ready to go. Uh, the 1998 movie is a viewing because it's especially for you. You saw Andy Blake and Bueller's choreography, which is the same as me. You see Julian Lynn's, so you see a slightly different version. You see a few things that have been canceled out and have been kind of updated. Um, and it's a stage production filmed, so it's like not a stage, mm. just like a pro shot, but it's really, really well done of like on the stage. So you're still seeing a theater experience. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm going to push you to, to, to find it. You can find it online. You can just, I think it's on the Broadway HD or some of those like streaming services now. Oh yeah. No, it's my, it's my new mission. We're ready to go. So, okay. So a couple other things about the show. What were your favorite moments that you like during the first time? Obviously, you said Tugger, but what else kind of like stuck out when you were watching it the first and second time? Um, I mean, I think one of the biggest things was <laughs> is the shoe drop. I feel like that's like um, it's like a PTSD moment for me now. <laughs> the shoe, uh, yeah. <laughs> That was that's like one of the biggest things that sticks out in my memory from that show. <laughs> you weren't ready for it. Not at all. Not at all. And then all of a sudden, just loud bang, huge shoe in the middle of the stage. And I was like, OK, <laughs> what just happened? Um, I wish you got to experience green eyes, which is where they start in the crowd to kick off the show. And they don't do that. They haven't done it in the U.S. since COVID but they brought it back in a couple other countries. But what they do is, and this was my first experience, is uh, they, the lights go out and you're kind of looking at stage and then all of a sudden all around you are flashing green eyes and all the cats come through the you know the aisles and around people and scare the living daylights out of children and, and adults alike. So if the shoe dropped really gave you PTSD, I'm sure <laughs> green eyes still gives me a little bit of a... Of a of a shiver every time, and I was not on the aisle. That is insane. I would love to experience. That. Yeah, especially like knowing that it would be coming. <laughs> yeah, not knowing is not not fun. knowing sounds awful. <laughs> yeah, the first time I was thankfully not on the aisle, and it, it it still really startled me. And I remember very very clearly the second time I told my friend I was like I'm just we can go and just don't buy aisle seats like I'm not sitting on the aisle, and so we bought the last row of something and I was like comfortably in the middle I was like I have a wall behind me I'm, I was like I'm safe and then somebody jumped over the green eyes like above me oh my god and I was like yep this is this is my nightmare right here <laughs> that's wild yeah. Yeah, I was sitting like smack, like center, center of the orchestra. So like, I don't think I would have had to deal with that. But <laughs> yeah. So besides the Jellicle and Heaviside layer, what other questions did you research after? Like what other things did you were so stuck in your head that you're like, I got to, I got to solve some of this. I think I like, I was very intrigued to like try and find out as much as I could about Rizabella. Mm-hmm. Um like why she ended up the way she did and what exactly because i mean nothing is spelled out in this show so like you you can piece things together through the songs yeah but like i definitely was like okay 
what's her story? How did she get so tattered? <laughs> like, yeah. why are they shunning her? Like, what's the deal? Is, it, is she like diseased? Because I mean, that's a thing with like animals, you know, mm-hmm. animal is sick. They push them out of like the group. But I was like, is that the reason they're being so mean to her? <laughs> and what's your what's your conclusion? That that was I mean, that. Basically. Was because she was sick. I mean, she was old and had gone through a bunch and they were kind of like, you're you're not with this in crowd anymore. We're these young, sprightly little cats and you're just kind of gross. Go away. <laughs> Interesting. So you, it was an illness for you. It was like, yeah. I, I don't want to catch a, a cat just, disease from yeah. her. <laughs> I, yeah, I've always looked at it as she left the family to go do bad things with McCavity and is trying to welcome back, but turned her back on her family. So they're still not thrilled with her. Ooh. And that's that's been my interpretation. I, I'm not sure. At this point, I don't know what I've been criticized or jokingly uh, criticized for making stuff up that's not true to the source. I'm like, yeah, that's this whole show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I'm like, I don't remember what I've made up, what have been told to me anymore, what's true. Like, there's just not, um, I think there's a cat's Bible out there somewhere, but there's not like a, it's not a published thing. It's like, mm-hmm. hey, here's what we're going to tell for this production to go on. But I've talked to people who've done regional productions and tours and everything, and they're not given all the story. They're given just the outline and told, here's kind of the, the core themes. This is what you need to, to make mm-hmm. so that the audience recognizes the key themes. But the rest is open for interpretation. And I think that's why this show can exist and so much can happen and why it's successful is because you can have so many people see it and have slightly different versions and not really ruin the, the plot. Like the whole, the, the Grisabella being ill totally would work. Cause then mm-hmm. memory still, you know, would be thinking back to when she was healthy and with her family, it would all still work. And I'm like, I don't know if that's right, but it, it fits. And that's a way you can walk out with it. And it doesn't change the like key theme of the story. Mm-hmm. I think that's why I was so drawn to this show is because there's so many questions and you can find the answers for yourself, but it doesn't mean that like you still, you still have no idea what's going on. Yeah. Even if you can come up with some some kind of answer for yourself, you could still go back and be like, what? <laughs> yeah. What is happening? <laughs> I've now seen it many times, heard a million different versions of people s- explaining it to me. And there are still things where I'm like, eh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure there. I've even thrown a couple things up on social media because I've made memes and jokes. And one was about Bombay, Arena and Demeter. Are they sisters, friends? lovers anything so i made a joke and i set off half the fan base that like that is totally wrong so i put a poll on social media and i got 50 50 wow directly down the middle hundreds of votes of the fan base completely 50 50 of if they're siblings or if they're lovers or friends or some version and so i'm like if this is something that's so simple and the whole fan base is split then there are a lot of those other little subplots that could be a million different mm-hmm. ways. Yeah, that's it's such an insane show. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break and then we'll be back for more of The Wrong Cat Died. So I want to pivot a little bit to the content creation piece of this. So mm-hmm. as a content creator, did you walk out of the show and was like, I got to do some content around this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> because it's... It's one of those shows. It, it's to me okay. You know, in the mini, in the movie uh, Pretty Woman, when like he takes her to the opera and he's basically just like people when they see it for the first time, they either fall in love with it and they're like opera fans for life, mm-hmm. or they walk away just like, nah, not not for me. That's yeah, not for me. That's what Cats is. <laughs> like, you see this show and you're either like, get me out of here, or you're like, wow, I need to know more. I need to know everything. That's a, it's such an interesting parallel. I because I've felt the same way um, about cats for a long time, and I do think like there are super fans. There are people that like know every inch and have seen the show hundreds and hundreds of times, and then there are people who hate it. But every single person who has hated it has yet to give me a reason, like a valid reason. It was just like, oh, it's not for me, or oh, it was weird. And I'm like, yeah, so are a lot of things that you've that you love, like that you liked. So I've yet to find like a true criticism of the show, um, which I'm, I'm looking for. 
Whereas I do think I have, I've heard real criticisms of opera. Um, but it is such an interesting moment because it's, it is very true. It's like, I did go see opera a couple years ago for the first time in, at the Met in New York. And I had that like, yeah, this isn't for me. Yeah. <laughs> it was, yeah. I enjoyed it. It was cool. I had a friend on stage. It was awesome to go see and perform. But I'm like, I got to read this whole thing. I'm like way up there. Everyone's dressed up like in the middle of New York. I got to ride home in the subway in my nice clothes. Like it's a different experience. Mm -hmm. um, so it is kind of a unique perspective of that, of, of the like, you walk, you walk in and it's either absolutely, I got to know every name, every cat, or you walk out just like, okay, <laughs> next show. Yeah, that's why, like, I knew I wanted to, like, post about it. Because it's either way, people have an opinion. Totally. Like, whether or not they've seen it, too. I feel like people who haven't seen it are either going to be like, oh, I'm just, I'm dying to see this show. Or like, please, what is this? This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of, mm -hmm. regardless of if they've seen it or not. And that's why I was like, I got to fuss about this just because I know people are going to have an opinion either way. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And I think the 19 or not, not 1998, the 2019 movies amplified that. Yes, exactly. More than you can possibly. That's how this show started. It was, you know, the I had seen it. I had made some jokes about it to friends. I had written about it, but I kind of didn't really talk much about cats and I'm not a content creator at the time. I wasn't doing anything. It was just personal friends and family. And then that trailer came out and I'm like, it's time. Like, this is like, let's, let's, let's lean into this. Cause that looks bonkers. And then, <laughs> you know, obviously it, it was awful. It didn't do well. And, and it's still, you know, it was, was it four years ago, five years ago, four years ago. It, um, it, it started to like, it's even having a little bit of a revival of people making fun of it again. So mm -hmm. It's just never ending, but I'd love to hear a little bit about how you got into content creation. Cause like, it's such a fun, unique, like the theater content creator world is so amazing group of people. Um, but is it something that you were like, did you just start posting and some stuff took off or were you like, no, nah, I'm going to dedicate time to this. Um, so this is a fun story. I majored in journalism in okay. college and very quickly realized that I didn't like writing in like news style. I liked telling stories, but I was always like, I gave my opinions way too much. And I always okay. got criticism from my like, professors that were just like, Olivia, you can't have opinions. It's the yeah, news. Too, you're too subjective for exactly. this. Exactly. And I was just like, F, I don't, I don't like that so much. And that was around the time when like blogging became like this mm -hmm. huge craze and everybody had a blog and I was introduced to that. And I was like, wait a second, I could like tell stories. I could still use my major to do this. I'm learning the correct skills for this. Like, so I started a blog and with the blog came my Instagram to promote the blog. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, the subject matter was completely different than theater. It was, I was talking about like, uh, like natural remedies using like different herbs and stuff like that. Like it was completely okay. a different subject matter. Um, but through all of that, I grew a following on Instagram and theater had always been a part of my life. Like I grew up in theater, seeing theater. There wasn't, there's never been a time in my life where I was completely removed from it. And uh, Broadway in Chicago invited me to a show and started inviting me again and again. And I realized that the only thing that actually like excited me when it came to posting was theater. And so I was like, why don't I just completely dedicate my platform to something mm -hmm. that actually like really excites me? Um, so yeah, so it was after like COVID happened and things started opening back up. Um, I reached back out to Broadway in Chicago and was like, hey, I would love to keep coming to your shows. Um, so they brought me back and that was, it was just like a complete 180 overnight of just like, I was like this lifestyle influencer and all of a sudden it was just like theater, theater 24 seven all the time. That's awesome. <laughs> did, uh, did you have anybody that reached out? It was like, Hey, wh what happened to this pivot? Like I was here for this other content and all of a sudden now I'm hearing about Dear Evan Hansen or Book of Mormon or whatever <laughs> that's in Chicago doing its, its previews. Um, the only people who had been previously following me that had reached out to me to be like, what, um, were super positive about it. They were like, wow, like I'm a huge theater fan. I've already loved your content, but this is 
this is like even better. Like, this is great. Um, I have had like, it's been for the last couple of years, kind of like a revolving door of people, Mm -hmm. like theater people finding me and like old followers being like, okay, no longer my kind of content, which is perfectly fine to me. Yeah. (laughs) I love it. The Venn diagram you had is just the people in the middle are the ones reaching out to you. And then everyone else is either slowly leaving their circle or you're adding to it, which is, which is fun. Have you had any, um, replies to some of your cat's content besides me, obviously? Um, that's like, Hey, I I had some more thoughts or like any of those type of things kind of go get, get some interesting replies. I posted a video about Tugger. (laughs) And it was like, it was a reel that was basically like, I saw cats for the plot and then it was the plot and it was just a video of Tugger doing his thing after bows. (laughs) That video got so much response. Like people were losing their minds. They were like, Rum Tum Tugger's the only reason I go see cats. And he's the entire reason I love cats. And people were freaking out over it. And I thought that was hilarious because I mean, I know that I loved him and I know that he was my favorite part of the show but to like it was it was it was wild it was wild how many people were responding to this <laughs> you struck a chord yes have have you in your research of tugger stumbled upon the street tugger version that they did the street tugger no what's no? that okay you're gonna go down a rabbit hole when we <laughs> when we hang up um there was a period of time where i was fascinated by this because i also loved i thought tugger's pole thing was just super fun a lot of it because it's just not my personality at all. And so it's like fun to see the opposite and like that, that whole, like everyone look at me very, very showy, um, style. And then I also saw some amazing one, Tyler Haynes and, um, was the first Broadway, uh, Tugger I saw. And I learned that there was a couple years in Australia and London right before Broadway, the Broadway revival where they tried to make it more contemporary hip hop. And I, it's called on the the fan sites and everything, Street Tugger. And I've talked to uh, Daniel Alceta, who did the Street Tugger Australia. He's about to be an angel yet. Awesome, awesome guy, awesome performer. So I was fascinated by the idea of like, let's completely change the song. Let's make it more hip hop. And you will, I, I'm excited for you to to go down this rabbit hole because if, you, if Tugger is your favorite part of the show, there is this little, you know, subsection of tugger's history that you will you will find fascinating oh i'm so excited to look this up (laughs) i will uh it's been a lot of my memes to be honest it's because i have been fascinated by it the whole (laughs) just the decision of it you know like it's Mm. it's the performance i've seen a couple bootlegs it's i'm really good like it's it's you know the the idea is really good it's just like hindsight looking back at it it's like Maybe you shouldn't have done this. Um, but it's kind of like a cool, interesting, like, how do you try to refresh something 30 years or so into the show? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're a Tugger fan, uh, Street Tugger is an interesting rabbit hole. Uh, yeah, no, I'm definitely looking that up. <laughs> I can't wait. Okay, let's do some rapid fire uh, before okay. we get to the most important question. So if you could go on in Cats and perform, who would you want to perform as? Oh, Grisabella. You want to do 15 minutes on stage, <laughs> go on, belt, go off. Or Rumble Teaser. Rumble Teaser. Okay. Because the Rumble Teaser I saw was, it just looked so fun. <laughs> it is. I, you probably saw, uh, I'm actually, Taryn maybe? Taryn, uh, yeah. Yeah. And so you want to do the cartwheels on stage. Yes. <laughs> Super fun. Love it. Love it. Um, I think I know your favorite cat is Tugger. Who's your least favorite cat? Um, Probably... Bustifer. <laughs> but yeah. So some busts for history for you. Uh he got cut from the Royal Caribbean cruise. So if you go see him on the Oasis of the Seas, he is not there. <laughs> um it's also Gus, so they play Bus and Gus. And it's probably one of the most common answers I get for <laughs> for this show, which is uh which is kind of sad because I feel like he's probably yeah. deserves a better life, but it is a very easy and correct answer for that. He's just I mean, he's, you know, cute little fat cat, but kind of forgettable. <laughs> yeah, I I agree. Um, favorite song from the show? Skimble Shanks. Skimble Shanks. Oh, yeah. How great is it? And you were an orchestra, so you didn't get blinded by the the light. No, uh, I didn't. From Skimble or McCavity. <laughs> but okay. that song gets stuck in my head all of the time. Yeah. Like randomly, too. I won't even have heard it for a while. 
all of a sudden it's in my head. <laughs> That's Mungo Jerry and Rumpel teaser for me. Mm, I, I just every that. once in a while. And and I finally pieced together. It's because it's one of the few times that there's only two cats on stage. So it's not overwhelming. And so you could I could focus purely on the two of them doing their number versus every other time I'm like, what are these two cats doing? What's going on over yes. here? They're jumping around over here. And so I wasn't fully immersed in any other song as much as that one. No, that makes total sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've I've got a lot of answers for this next one, but as a content creator, which cat do you think would be the best content creator and what is their content going to be centered around? Oh, gosh. Um, There's a lot of answers to this, I think. <laughs> I, gosh, in this day and age and knowing what's popular, I feel like Mungo Jerry and Rumble Teaser, like as a duo, mm. would be the best. Yeah. Um, cause it, to me, it's in line with like the like pranksters on YouTube oh, yeah. and like people who just do crazy stunts for like clickbait, like that kind of thing. I feel like the two of them could have quite an interesting little, little thing going there. Totally. There's also a lot of couple content, like on TikTok, there's a lot of like husband and wife or boyfriend, girlfriend that do a lot of things together. They could easily start doing dancing together and pranks yes. together and yeah. all kinds of stuff. <laughs> I've always thought you've got a bomb belly arena or Victoria doing dance numbers and like mm. get readies with me and stuff like that. I think Buster for Jones is going to have a cooking channel. Oh my gosh, that would be amazing. <laughs> I think Tugger definitely is doing some form of like dance and, you know, he's he's got it. There's a lot. There's so many answers. Mr. There's, Mistopheles. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the one that I thought recently, cause I've asked this a lot and I've thought about this way, way more than I should admit. <laughs> um, what I thought about recently was that I think there's like a skimble shanks or a monkish trap are doing some type of like business analysts. Like here's how you do this on Excel and yes. you know, like here's some hacks for that. And they're just sitting there, you know, figuring that out and showing you how to do that. So I think there's a, a world for them there. That is so accurate. <laughs> okay. Million dollar question. Uh, I've argued at length that I don't think Grizabella is the right jellical choice. So as someone who's seen it recently, saw a very great Grizabella, but also a very young Grizabella, I want to know, are you going to agree with me or are you going to defend Grizabella? And if you're not going to defend Grizabella, who is your jellical choice? I am not defending Grizabella. All right. <laughs> but there's a whole loophole, or not loophole, there's just... My mind went down a full rabbit hole trying to figure out who I thought would be a better choice. And at first, I landed on Gus. Mm -hmm. You know, that feels like the obvious choice. You know, he's a cat. He's lived a great life. Time for him to go. But then I was like, he still just loves reliving his glory days and teaching the young cats about his life. And mm -hmm. I feel like he's too happy. Mm -hmm. I feel like he's, he's too content with where he's at. Yeah. So then I was like, okay, no Gus, which brought me back to Grizabella because I was like, maybe she is the right choice. I mean, she's, you know, tattered and torn. She's yeah. clearly had it rough. Maybe she was the right choice, but she was like just welcomed back to her family. Mm -hmm. So we got to give her the time to like relish yeah, She's that, next year. She's next right? year. Like give her some time. She's like going to be happy again. We can't just like rip that away from her immediately. Which brought me to the answer that I feel like might be controversial. Ooh. My answer is McCavity. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> and here is my thought process behind that. There's the saying, like, hurt people hurt people, you know? Mm -hmm. And I feel like McCavity has got some demons going on mm -hmm. that I feel like he just needs some kind of, like, sign of compassion or like like a com like just send him on his way okay because not only do i feel like he's hurting and he needs some help there and this would be like you know a good thing for him yeah it would be a great thing for everybody else i mean everyone's yeah. terrified of him and he only causes trouble so like let's do a good thing for him and get him out of here <laughs> yeah I, so it's he has a few votes He's not, he's okay, not great. zero. So it's not, <laughs> not totally controversial. I think the way you're thinking about it is really interesting, which is 
it's not a reward necessarily as the choice. Like that's, I think a lot of people are like, oh, this is a reward or this is who needs it most. And I think if you're arguing need, you're making a case that there is need for McCavity, that mm. he's been hurt so much that maybe if someone shows him some compassion, his next life will be better because mm-hmm. of the the need. So is that kind of like how you're thinking about yes, it? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm here for it. I'm here for any non Grizabella <laughs> vote. Uh, but yeah, I mean I think I think it makes sense. There is a little bit of two, like I know someone said very early on in this podcast they they picked McCavity and their reason was is that there's a you know a little bit of a strain on the the community with him. Mm. And is next year better if you kind of alleviate that? And Grizabella isn't that strain anymore. You've already alleviated that with with her being welcomed back. So, yeah, McCavity could go, and you could have a better year, and then you can come back and even you know a a better uh, cat to society. Yes, I agree. I like the journey you took to get there, <laughs> which is like we're gonna think through every single piece. Mm. of every cat. I thought cat. about it a lot. <laughs> yeah. Did you think about every single character of like, oh, hey, yes. who, uh, who did you, who was the, like, you, you told your top three, who was kind of like four, five, and six that you were like, all right, I, I could consider these, but I've got to eliminate them for X, Y, and Z reason. Um, I got to remember now. Uh, who else did I think about? I mean, the like seemingly older cats I thought about Bustopher. He seems a little older to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, kind of forgettable. Yeah. So More food was, to go around for everybody if he's gone. Yeah. Um, hmm. The other two that come up a little bit. Well, Old Deuteronomy comes up a lot. And then Jenny Any Dots comes up a little bit. Jenny, really? Mm-hmm. She's I, supposed to be considered older because she's like the motherly cat. Mm. And so there is a little bit of the like... When's her turn? Yeah. I thought about older Deuteronomy, but I'm like, he's just kind of like, he's the saving grace of everyone. I don't yeah. want to take him away. <laughs> Not yet. I, I like your eliminating problems of the, of the group. Like, let's make this a, a more collectively better society by, by sacrificing the one that's the most challenging, even though that's almost feeling like it's giving them a reward. It's like, uh, yeah, but yeah. like, yeah. Even if you think of it from the standpoint of a reward, it's like, dude needs some love in his life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. I, I like, I like the vote. I like the thought process. I like you working through <laughs> all of this. I like the fact that you have only seen the show less than a year, two years at most, and you, you are, you are in. You're in oh, I'm deep. I'm so in deep with this show. <laughs> You are continuing. I'm sure you're going to have more ideas. You're going to learn all about Street Tugger. Oh, yes. And, and I'm going to be... watch the, the movie. Yep, Not you're like watch the new the movie. The 1990 movie. <laughs> Don't do them back to back. If you do, do the 2019 first and then palette cleanse with the 1998. Okay. But I'm like scared to watch the 2019 Have you one. seen it ever? I have it. Oh, it's an experience. <laughs> it's different. Um, It's... Let's be honest. It's not as bad as everyone makes it out to be. It's not a good movie by any means. Mm-hmm. But as a, if you are a fan of cats, there are parts that you will find super entertaining and super fun. And there are a couple of performances that are amazing. It's a little hard to watch because the editing is very like jump cutty. And so you'll see this like really cool dance and you won't get to really see it because it's mm-hmm. like you're moving from different angles. Um, and the Mungo Jerry and Rumpel teaser is the London version, which I am not a fan of. It's a totally different song. Hmm. Um, but there's, it gets panned. It deserves to get panned. It was an, an interesting decision. If you are a fan of cats, there are going to be moments that you will find wildly entertaining and enjoy. I've, I've, I've been wanting to watch it just because I'm like craving some cats, you know? But for me, the movie is just, like freaks me out. The, the disproportionate like sizes. Yeah, you just, just, all that stuff. You just, you just got to ignore <laughs> You're basically going to watch a little bit of dance and some singing, um, and you got to ignore the rest because the rest is like some of the decisions are mind blowing, and you're going to sit there and be like, "How? Why?" You know. But if you can get past that, there are some moments. There are some moments that are a you know true to cats, a good movie. There's incredible performers in there, some really really talented people in the movie. Um, not all the 
household names, but like some of the dancing and like singing and performers, the Broadway people and the ballet people and the dancers are, it's really incredible what they're doing in there that got lost in the rest of the movie. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll die. But in. if you've not seen the 1998 <laughs> movie, that you've got to see first. Like that is that is top priority for me. That now. <laughs> is pure, I, and it's definitely streaming somewhere. I'm almost positive it's on Broadway HD or one of those um, streaming services. It's got to be on like at least Prime, right? Buy it. I don't, <laughs> yeah, for, yeah, maybe to, to rent or buy. I'm sure you could probably rent Which or buy I it would. somewhere. I would. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> You, if you've owned the VHS trailer, you got to own a, a digital copy. Right? <laughs> um, but yeah, you can find it. So um, how can people stay in touch with you on social media and then everything you're doing and all the content you're creating? Um, my biggest thing is Instagram. You can find me at Olivia K. Da Silva. Um, come follow along. It'll be fun. Yeah, we will uh, tag everything and make sure we, we uh, reshare your your tugger reel yes. of uh, that, <laughs> that everyone loved. And as you, I'm sure you're going to now go down the rabbit holes of other stuff. So as you post more, you know, we'll, we'll be excited to follow along. Oh yeah. No, I'm definitely doing a deep dive into cats now. <laughs> Love it. This has been so fun. Thank you so much for coming on, sharing your story and your thoughts. And it's been great to have you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And thanks everyone else for listening to this episode of The Wrong Cat Died, the podcast breakdown of the cat catastrophe. To follow along, you could subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any of those podcasts. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Threads, and TikTok at The Wrong Cat Died, or check out our website, TheWrongCatDied.com. Mm-hmm.